Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar um, about the ITS Congress in Toulouse. My name is Lisa Bog Anderson. I'm the Congress Director and Director of Communications at Ertico ITS in Brussels, and I have the pleasure of hosting today's webinar. So thank you for joining. Just for those who have only been with us uh, for this webinar, a little bit of background. This is a last webinar in a series of webinars that sort of took us on the journey towards the uh, European Congress that is happening in 10 days in Toulouse. Um, we have covered the various topics uh, of the Congress and today we are dealing with the last topic from large-scale trials to deployment. Um, so just a couple of house rules. Everybody will be in or are in listen-only mode, um, but you are more than welcome to pose questions um, through the GoTo tool. Uh, there will be a Q&A at the end. Uh, also, please be aware that the webinar will be recorded and we will, of course, be sharing it through our channels as usual. With that, uh, let us move to a quick overview of the agenda. Um, there are two parts to the agenda as usual. First, a more high level um, part where I give a quick update on the Congress. And then we have our guest, Guillaume Puisseux uh, from Michelin DDI, who is the strategy and marketing director uh, and who is also a Congress partner. So we're very delighted about that. And Guillaume will talk a little bit about leveraging driving behavior data for safer roads. So that's part one. And then we have part two, where my colleague, um, from Ertico, Frank Dams, who is senior manager uh, in the Department of Innovation and Deployment. He will moderate this uh, panel, um, which uh, goes a little bit more in depth and zooms in a little bit on the role of uh, startups in driving deployment. And Frank will introduce each of the speakers in detail when we come to part two. So with that, uh, let me just give a quick update on where we are on the Congress. Um, first of all, I look really forward to seeing everybody there. We're expecting around 2,500, 3,000 participants. Uh, we have a technical program where we have just about 100 sessions where specialists meet to discuss the various topics. Um, of course, we also have the big exhibitor space where you can see uh, over 90 stands and we also have a number of demonstrations and technical visits. You will also hear that we have quite a strong startup program that Frank will talk a little bit about when we come to part two and of course we have as usual a number of fabulous commercial partners uh, and media partners and in the high level program we have over 40 speakers uh, who will take us through the three days. So quick overview of our uh, event partners. Um, as mentioned, we have Michelin here today, but um, here you can see uh, a couple of the other partners. And if we move on um, quickly as uh, tradition has it, um, we have a number of super interesting demonstrations um, which are organized right outside the exhibition area. You can go on the website and have a look in detail. Uh, on top of that, um, we also have a number of technical visits um, that is organized by the host. Uh, and you can see here a couple of examples, um, really, really, really interesting uh, visits that you can do. Uh, again, you can go uh, online and register um, for the technical visits, the demonstrations, you just turn up. As I say, it's right outside the exhibition hall, but uh, make sure to go online as soon as possible um, to register. Another thing which is really important to do uh, is to register to the Congress, because then 
you can download and start using the app. And the Congress app um, is uh, your tool to get the most out of the Congress. Obviously, the whole program is there, uh, but also it really has great opportunities to you know, book your schedule in advance, uh, discover who are the people I really want to meet. Um, when we had the app in the Hamburg Worldwide Congress last year, over 3,000 meetings were being set up. And um, I can tell you that it works really, really well because people get access to high ranking sea level representatives and city representatives that would otherwise maybe be a bit hard to get to. It works really well. You send a message and people answer, why not? Let's meet up. But remember to register to get access to the app. Here is just a, a quick snapshot of exhibitors. If you just run through the slides, as usual, we show uh, just to give people an idea of who is there. Um, and last but not least, of course, remember how you can stay up to date. Um, we have, of course, on our website, you can find the whole program and you can also register. And uh, we also have our social channels and our newsletter uh, that comes out bi-weekly. And last but not least, um, let's now go a little bit more in depth into the topic. As I said, it's all about how we go from large scale trials to deployment. So how we get the technologies and the innovation to the market. Um, and of course, it's not only about uh, large scale uh, trials in cities, it's about modeling, simulation, it's about acceptance, it's about the role of the concerns that there as well. And it's about how do we take what we have been building and test it on the ground in real situations and with real people. But let's now move to just a quick overview of how you can actually learn more about large scale trials to deployment in the Congress. This is such a broad topic that it transcends everything uh, in the Congress. Nevertheless, uh, we wanted to highlight here in particular Plenary 2 uh, on the Tuesday, um, maneuvering around obstacles on the road to deployment. And you can also see in the technical program, you remember I mentioned we have 400 sessions. Uh, we have a number of SIS or special interest sessions and also uh, a few technical and research papers that deal with specifically this topic. And you can find now on the website the very detailed program um, so that you can plan your uh, three days. And with that, let's move to Guillaume um, from Michelin DDI. Guillaume, the floor is yours, please. Well, thank you, Lisa. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. I'm very glad to have that opportunity this afternoon. Uh, welcome, everyone, to uh, this uh, Michelin uh, DDI webinar, ahead of uh, our presence uh, at the ITS European Congress in Toulouse. Actually, the entire DDI team and myself, we are very impatient to be there because we'll be uh, showcasing our uh, most advanced uh, digital safety services and we hope to uh, meet uh, uh, everybody there. Thank you very much. So um, uh, starting with the, uh, uh, the group perspective, uh, the mission group has defined three fields of activities, sources uh, of sustainable growth. Of course, you know the entire activity from the mission group. Uh, the second uh, domain of, uh, of activity is so-called around tires, uh, which aims at providing the mobility ecosystem additional digi uh, digital services and services to fleets, for example, to make uh, mobility smarter, safer, and greener. I could name uh, fleet management services. I could name uh, fleet electrification services, and of course, Michelin uh, DDI services for uh, safer roads. If we move uh, a bit closer to uh, Michelin DDI, so uh, it's a startup of the Michelin Group, and uh, we're in fact a data company operating in the take for good uh, domain. Uh, what we do, we analyze how people drive, so to allow uh, road authorities 
to uh, help prevent crashes. Our unique expertise uh, in driving behavior relies on, uh, for example, uh, the 1.5 billion kilometers traveled we have analyzed in France, or another example, the, the over 30 million vehicle uh, and drivers connected as uh, the data we, uh, we collect in, uh, in the US. How do we make that happen? Uh, well, that, that's based on our know-how, which is about collecting and transforming the data and then delivering actionable insights to our customers. We collect several forms of data uh, from ourselves and also from our partners because we believe, we are convinced, in fact, combi combining data is uh, absolutely essential to deliver high level of uh, value in our services. After collecting the data, we're going to transform that data so to make it a bit more meaningful. And for example, we're going to contextualize the data uh, we are managing actually uh, several thousands of uh, different combinations of contacts, of course, with the roads, uh, the road type, the weather conditions, time of day, and etc. With that uh, raw material, uh, the enriched data, we will uh, run our proprietary algorithm so to uh, deliver what we call actionable insights, meaning by that digital services from which road authorities will be able to diagnose road safety and uh, take preventive measures to uh, to save uh, to uh, save uh, crashes right from happening i propose we look at a short video to explain it all thank you actually we don't have the sound of the video driving data for a safer mobility is our main driver. What sets us apart? Our expertise in driving behavior analysis and our know-how around the full data value chain. With high data frequency and maximized accuracy, we capture every variable from a driving trip, our foundation for a thorough driving behavior analysis. We enrich the data captured with off-road, time of day, weather data. With this advanced contextualization, we isolate behavior from environment for a precise analysis framework. Our analysis model is unique. We don't only focus on driving events, but our algorithms rely on a continuous analysis model. We effectively assess behavior and detect any risk indicator. Every second of driving is compared to our reference. A model defined through millions of trips, reflecting the safe behavior based on context and type of road. We offer solutions and insights to help you unlock the potential from data and driving behavior analysis. API catalog, mobile application, analytics services. We cover all your needs to address your business stakes and innovate with new offers from coaching drivers to optimizing road infrastructure maintenance. Thank you. And I promise that uh, if you come visit us at the booth, we'll have the same video with uh, better sound conditions. Uh, concretely speaking, we have packaged our data services into uh, the safer road suite. Uh, our actionable insights, for example, include uh, near-miss data or near-hit data. You know all those situations where uh, crashes almost happened. Uh, in fact, drivers tend to forget about those situations, but our data does not. Right? And uh, uh, we rank, we identify from that data, we identify and we rank hotspots of near-misses so that uh, one can uh, identify where are the locations we should look uh, first to help prevent uh, uh, to help prevent crashes from happening. In a nutshell, uh, with our services, road authorities can uh, benefit from uh, simple and digital uh, safety diagnosis. There is no need to deploy any infrastructure. Uh, of course, second, the identification uh, and the ranking of uh, near miss hotspots. Third, uh, road authorities are able to do uh, what we call before and after analysis, so to prove the progress in terms of uh, road safety. 
and fourth, uh, road authorities are able to uh, uh, rely on uh, KPI-based measures uh, to uh, justify funds, focus, active, uh, focus actions, and decide for the correct, uh, the correct, uh, the right corrective actions. Uh, that's uh, that's about it for in a nutshell. I hope uh, you got uh, that flavor of what we do. Uh, my team and I will be uh, pleased to welcome you at our booth, uh, location C2 in Toulouse. And of course, you can join our workshop if you want to drill into more concrete use cases that we have uh, uh, realized with our customers, both in France and the US. The workshop uh, is on June 1st, 10 30 a.m. Please join us. And uh, uh, waiting for Toulouse to start, uh, please follow us on LinkedIn by uh, typing in Michelin DDI. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Guillaume. This was super interesting. I will definitely come by the stand in Toulouse. Uh, in the meantime, let's now move to uh, the second part of this webinar, where we go a little bit more in depth with my colleague, Frank, as I said before, who is a senior manager in our innovation and development department. Frank, the floor is yours, please. Yeah, thanks a lot, Lisa, and uh, thanks for giving me the honor. So. Uh, I'm senior manager at Innovation and Employment, but I've also quite a role within Ertico to guide uh, startups' activity of Ertico. And uh, next slide. It gives uh, really uh, the, uh, yeah, let's say, the, the boost towards uh, deployment uh, from large scale trials. In fact, uh, in many cases, coming from the IND department, Innovation and Deployment, it's all about moving forward to techno technology readiness levels that we know from the Commission. And you see that, uh, yeah, it goes from research to applied research to technology development. But the, the, the next uh, push is, of course, that it goes to the prototype and system development. And that enables, uh, let's say, the large businesses that our partners are looking for. And that's exactly where this uh, 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 subject is about. It's about large scale trials to deployment. Next slide. Next. And in fact, uh, if you look to our program for startups, it's under the motto connect, innovate and grow. And that's really the whole, uh, let's say, uh, move from the technology readiness level. Connect is about the idea. It's the initial research and it uh, enables the startups to radiate their idea to our to our partnership that they get to know the idea. Innovate is uh, getting the partnership, getting the innovators into our projects. It's moving the technology readiness level from, let's say, technology readiness level four to seven, moving forward to their ideas on services and products that they have in mind and working together with the partnership in the projects. And grow is, in fact, the last part. Grow is really, you have customers, you have your, products ready and you are ready to deploy or you have already customers but you're looking for geographical scaling or maybe product scaling and that we do in our congresses to connect let's say these companies with the uh, economical environments of our congresses like we do in Hamburg for instance in the World Congress and for instance in Toulouse of course uh, within two weeks. Next slide. So Having uh, to support, let's say, the, the statements uh, we have today, excellent speakers from uh, startups like IoT Baseplate and Asimov. Um, we welcome Mr. Marcus Dorn, IoT Baseplate, and Mr. Ibon Arigaldi from Asimov. And we have also uh, Eduardo Felici from DG Move that explains how the Commission and the uh, policy can support this action. Uh, and of course, uh, in Toulouse, we have a startup, a startup hub, uh, which is a 24 startup booths that you can visit of innovators. And we have a whole program. So on Monday, we have the startup initiative pitches out of the Ertico network of networks. You find representatives, winners from the regional contest that we did with our partners. And they have their networks. They selected uh, delegates towards uh, the Toulouse and we have their pitches on Monday 14.30 starts. And it's all going to happen in the auditorium. And on Tuesday, uh, we have a fantastic uh, collaboration with uh, the IND, the, the IND 
and the uh, European Startup Prize, where uh, we have a joint uh, collaboration in uh, inviting, let's say, investors that are going to look to pitches from the winners that we did on Monday. So there will be three winners on Monday out of our ethical network. They will also be part of this more European approach. Uh, and there will be, uh, let's say, a contest uh, going for this uh, EU startup prize. So we have live streaming pitches at 10 hour 30. We have a network lunch at 12.40. And we have, uh, let's say, of course, fur further networking possibilities with these innovators in the afternoon. And then we have the winner of winners and the awards, and these will be announced at our ethical booth uh, in the ceremony on Tuesday 31st in the afternoon at 15.30. So we welcome you to all these activities. And if you are really into innovation and how you can move from large-scale deployment to uh, large-scale testing to deployment, then I welcome you. But our speakers will tell you more about their case. And I welcome you, Mr. Marcus Dorn, IoT Baseplate. And Marcus, you're online and I'll give you the floor. Perfect. Thank you, Frank. Um, we are very glad that IoT Basepit to be part of the Ertico network and also part of, of the European Congress. So first of all, let me introduce. My name is Marcus Dorn. I'm CTO and co-founder of Onsite Data. We are actually a very new um, Austrian startup founded in 2020. Um, and our core product is IoT Baseplate, which is a hardware and software solution for traffic infrastructure digitization. So actually, what's the situation? High quality um, is key for improving traffic safety, traffic ecology, and quality of daily mobility. That's actually all our focus in the whole um, pro program. So there are a lot of innovations, exciting innovations around um, in the industry, especially for high-level roads and, and, and um, highways, for example. So our focus um, is to record and analyze um, temporary traffic events as, for example, roadworks, driving bans, detours, and situations which are not um, exactly clear and, and actually um, being temporary on road. So everywhere where it's part of interest for our customers. So why it's important? So we have many silo solutions, many nice applications. Uh, but there are sometimes uh, very complicated IT systems. So our way is to find a simple way to generate data of the real traffic situation, especially important for in future autonomous driving, uh, for traffic measures and for improvements um, on the traffic situation. So um, you can go to the next page. So what is our um, idea? So our idea is actually to, to use a well-known existing element, which you can see here. It's the TLK1 base bit, which you see everywhere on the roads, on roadworks, and actually um, generating traffic um, infrastructure data based on this um, K1 element. So we're actually doing a retrofit, uh, and we add power, sensors, and controllers to these models to provide traffic and location data in a very easy manner. So actually our characteristics or what we want to do is to install such systems in a minute and to, to do all the things without having an IT competency. So actually by using the IT base bit, we are providing a versatile um, sensor and actor platform for traffic data generation. So you could go to the next page. So I'm coming actually to one of our pilots. So we are founded last year, but we are already in a very interesting pilot situation where one of our customers, which is the city of Graz, is actually evaluating um, the system in, in Graz directly. Graz is part of the trans Network um, Hub. And the important thing is to digitalize data in the traffic, um, let's say, in the city for having traffic events. So we're actually doing a six-month evaluation period together with the city of Graz and learning a lot about the network. So shortly, what are the major problems and concerns of City of Graz? So actually, the problems is uh, we address is how to simply generate real-time data, especially preparing for real-time traffic information service, which is part of the EU delegated regulation. How to automatically synchronize actually planning data with uh, real actual data, especially for temporary events, uh, and also how to provide this data, high-quality data for third parties. Um, in real time, for example, routing data. 
So what we also do is to find the very simple process and how to execute and install such systems um, being done by construction companies, for example, which actually whose task is not really the scope to install IT systems. So next page, if you, uh, if you think about the target of the pilot, Actually, it's simply time and cost saving. So how can we introduce an automated data generation process? Uh, we are also evaluating the system behavior. So about theft, about how, how the public is treating such systems. Um, and of course, we are also trying to find uh, if there is a way to actually uh, collect evidence evaluation, for example, in manipulating traffic signs. Yeah? In addition to that, um, as I said, a very ins easy installation process, which can be done by everyone. Um, and we also want to invo involve executing partners like um, Roadworks company and site security companies to build up the system. So at the end, uh, we are also providing kind of synchronization uh, of planned data with real-time data. So actually our system is providing an update to uh, third-party systems. So actually, um, how is it done? We have different phases. The first one is to install, um, let's say, K1 um, systems on traffic signs and to automatically char uh, characterize the event like roadworks. Um, the sensors are actually uh, installed um, and activated automatically. Um, it reports the installation, it reports the activation, it also reports changes so that there cannot be any manipulations on site. In a phase two, we actually um, add the real-time status to the planned status. For example, if you have roadworks planned, you have a kind of execution time and actually our system is providing the real-time data uh, when the roadworks is closed, uh, when it's finished or when it's built up. Um, actually in the phase three, we're going one step further. So we also want to provide these real-time events in a very secure way um, to a national event database. So at the end, that's third parties like navigation system providers or other providers are really um, getting a, a, a actual state and can also process the data with an open interface for um, traffic improvements and also for actually adding data like to navigation systems and so on. So the pilot is quite, um, quite huge. So if you want to know more about our ideas and what we're doing and the results, please also visit us um, on the startup area on our booth. We are very welcome to tell you more about what we are actually doing. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful proposal and wonderful example uh, on your way to deployment, let's say, uh, testing it in, uh, in a real life environment like in Graz and working together with the authorities. It's really an example of what we probably hear later from Felice uh, uh, in his intentions in Europe. Uh, but before we go there, uh, I introduce Ibon Argaldi from Asimov, which has also a fantastic proposal as a startup. And Ibon, I hope you're online. I see you appearing. So can I invite you to take the floor and take your story? Thank you very much, Frank. Really. And thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, the, the examples that I'm going to explain now is really uh, a real deployment in a municipality in, in Spain, the municipality of Cunit, very close to Barcelona. Um, but it's a very small city, and this is a good example of the things that then we can do in, in, the, in the big cities where really these problems are more important. Uh, if we go to the first slide, uh, here we, we can see the problem. Really, uh, we are monitoring the different elements in the infrastructure because really, in this moment, all this monitorization is, is applied visually uh, with people that is driving or working to, to detect the different things that are happening. And really, uh, this means that today they are manual inspections, lack of evidence, uh, a prioritization of the, of the roles letting the secondary roads in the in other side and, and this is very very difficult to do. If we see in the in the following slide we can see that we have an approach to change this way to do uh, and, and we have taken this city, the city of, of Cunit, because it's a small city, 10 kilometers square with 150 kilometers of lane sections and with a responsible of the infrastructures but they had not people to do that. 
Uh, so they had not the, they had this possibility. That they always were expecting or waiting for for the calls from the citizens to to detect uh, signals that were uh, bad or or road markings that were with low visibility or irregularities in the pavement. In the following slide, we will see a solution that it really is uh, focused in the use of computer vision, artificial intelligence, and sensors to detect the different elements to classify them uh, and to analyze uh, their state using sensors and, and these technologies and analyzing all the things on cloud. Um, in the following slide, uh, we will see how is really the solution that has three parts. On the left, you can see the devices on board. And, and in this case, in the city of Kunid, we have used the devices on board of the vehicles from the police. Uh, so, they were working normally they only had to switch on the devices early in the morning and the rest of the day the the device was working monitoring the infrastructure then all this data and video that is recorded are sent to the cloud and in the cloud is really where we apply the the, the different algorithms and the different models of computer vision to detect the things and to analyze if they are correct or not and finally on the right you can see uh, uh, the web interface that is the, the, the web that the responsible of the of the infrastructure was watching because uh, he didn't need to go to the to the places he only need to check in the interface and receive the alarms in case something is wrong uh, so what, this is the solution and and we have applied it for three things for vertical signage for lane markings and road markings and for irregularities on the pavement and we have to uh, during three months one month each solution to detect all the things and to and to detect the, the, the different problems. I have uh, three small examples in three small videos uh, the, uh, to, to watch this, this service. Uh, the first one is for the vertical signage. Here you can see this is the device installed inside the vehicle of the police and um, automatically is creating the map of the different traffic signs only with the with the vehicle that is uh, taking the uh, by computer vision to detect detecting the different elements. Uh, of course, we blur the persons and we blur the vehicles to ensure the privacy of the of the citizens. In the in the next uh, video, we can see the detection of the irregularities in the pavement. Here you can see on the surface how we are detecting different irregularities, and we are we are creating this map that you see on the left. That is uh, a heat map to understand where are the places with the worst pavement and, and with more uh, budget required for that. And in the third video, you can see the part of the road markings, very important in the cities uh, and sometimes uh, due to works or due to the, uh, the aging of the road markings, uh, they are not easy to see. And we are collecting all this information and, and giving the information with a heat map also of uh, bad visibility places. So well, this is this is the the demo of, of, of these three services, and thank God the city of Kunit has got uh, all this information in only three months, but really could be get in, in shorter time for all their streets uh, with the detection that only with one pass is uh, is getting the 97 percent of the successful rates in a single pass. Uh, using in this case the vehicles from the police, we have not put we have uh, avoided the, the, to put all the vehicles in the streets, so it's, it's, it's better in this way. And, and of course, nowadays, uh, Kunit is, uh, feels that they, are, uh, they have a system that is reliable and, and they can put this information in open data to give this information to navig uh, navigator providers or uh, HD map providers. So well, this is uh, the, the project that we have we have developed, and of course, this is idea for for bigger or larger cities. And only uh, thank give the thanks to the EIT Urban Mobility because uh, well, the, the city uh, has received the financing uh, from them to to develop this project. Thank you very much. Okay, Yvonne. Uh, also, again, a very interesting application, a very innovative application where authorities probably would like uh, to know more about it. And uh, talking about authorities, I guess our next speaker is coming from the DG Move, 
Mr. Eduardo Felici. Welcome. Uh, can you give us a policy officer insights in what you are doing and what kind of policy you develop to support? Thanks. Please not. Felici? Eduardo? Uh, yeah, we are looking for the speaker, in fact. Eduardo, are you online? Eduardo is here. Um, and was here before. Yeah, he was online, yeah. But he seems not to be green. <laughs> No. Uh, yeah, we apologize for this. Uh, yeah, I think it was here. Hello, yes. Oh, it just okay, but it was just... before, before you start, may I do an appeal to all the audience which is online uh, to also remember that you can post questions and that uh, on the previous subject you post just your question into the webinar and then we have uh, let's say uh, the possibility to answer that uh, when all the speakers have gone so after eduardo eduardo go ahead thank you very much frank and apologies to all uh, being back in the office has advantages and disadvantages one of the disadvantages is that you can get distracted by someone walking by while uh, the, the session is going so apologies for that um happy to be with you this afternoon and um to uh, uh, present to you some of the lessons learned from the ITS directed deployment. Uh, of course, we from DG Move, I, I work at DG Move in the unit for sustainable and intelligent transport. Uh, we look at, uh, at ITS and the deployment from a bit of a distance. Uh, nevertheless, I'd like to share some thoughts with you today. So, of course, ITS is a relatively young domain, especially if you look at the uh, side of uh, dig digitalization. Yet we are coming from a long way. So the idea that we started off with uh, monomodal engineering solutions like variable message science, you can see here on the left, the deployment in the Netherlands from the 1980s to a network-wide IT approach. So the idea that you know we're going beyond simply trying to find the right solutions for single modes, but integrating it into a mobility system uh, through the use of uh, uh, IT and digitalization. Now on the next slide, you'll see that we have the ITS directive, which some of you might, uh, might be aware of, created in 2010. So quite a while ago already, with the idea to create a framework for the deployment of, uh, of intelligent transport systems in the field of road transport and for interfaces with other modes of transport. Now, the focus on this was clearly on digital solutions to provide um, innovative services driven by, by data to ensure that road users are better informed, make safe from better informed decisions, uh, can travel in a more coordinated way and make smarter use of, uh, of transport networks. Now. Um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see some of the achievements and developments under the ITS directive uh, so far. So, as I said, we started in 2010, where um, things like the smartphone was just was just coming out. Uh, mobility as a service didn't exist yet as a term, and automated vehicles were just starting to be uh, developed. Yet, we started from the point of view of trying to make sure that as much data as possible was uh, accessible and can be and could be reused by uh, by services. So we have five delegated regulations under the ITS directive, looking at multimodal travel information services, real-time traffic services, uh, safety-related services, e-call, and safe and secure truck parkings. You can see that we really like our acronyms uh, at the Commission. Um, and, and under the ITS directive, we have also um, uh, arranged the creation of national access points. So these are the points that in every member state uh, are used to uh, provide access to data uh, on all these different, uh, different aspects. Now, also, we have uh, provided support for implementation of harmonized standards, uh, DATEX2 being a very important one in the field. Uh, we have ensured that there's regular reporting on ITS projects and developments in the member states, so uh, that we, everyone is aware of what is happening. Um, and we have, of course, financial support through the Connecting Europe facility and, and program support actions. What are we doing today? So we are working on uh, harmonizing these national access points. As I mentioned, every member state has one. They can be quite different from uh, from each other. So we're trying to see how they can develop further into the future uh, by harmonizing more, by ensuring that uh, businesses, service providers uh, recognize and know how to access uh, all these 27 different national access points. 
uh, using common standards and the common interfaces. At the same time, we are revising the ITS directive in order to support all these new developments. As I said, uh, mobility as a service was not reflected. Uh, the connected, cooperative, and automated mobility aspects were not uh, were not uh, reflected. And one of the main main uh, proposals that we're doing is to mandate the availability of data. So not only sharing what you have uh, already digitalized through national access points, but actually trying to see which data needs to exist to ensure that certain ITS services can uh, can be deployed. And the last point here is the mobility data space, uh, a big buzzword, but of course uh, trying to understand that or trying to 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 achieve that um, all the different domains which we have in mobility. Um, and the data which is created by legislation is bound together somehow to, to avoid the silos which we have today um, in terms of, uh, of these different modes uh, coming together, ensuring uh, cross-fertilization of all the data which is, uh, which is available. Next slide, please. So I've, um, I've chosen a few projects to have a look at since this is a session on, uh, on uh, trialing and, and eventually deployment. So I've done a scan of uh, what is being input by... Um, by Horizon 2020 projects uh, in terms of ITS, and I'd like to share a few reflections uh, with you. So first of all, as I said, we're moving from modal modal solutions to more and more integrated approaches. And you see this here in the Move 21 projects where they are looking for an integrated approach to passenger and goods transport. So you see that these two uh, separate domains uh, are seen as, or are regarded through a holistic lens um, to ensure that market-ready solutions are delivered based on uh, proven to work in different governance settings. So this idea that you're not only looking at technical engineering solutions, you're not only looking at data, you're not only looking at passengers or goods, but you're looking at an integrated approach, including the policy aspects, including infrastructure, including vehicles and energy sources, and including technology. And uh, of course, this then um, comes together in the mobility logistics hubs in the cities where all these things come together. Uh, so this was uh, well, uh, the first, the first uh, the first reflection would be that we are moving towards much more integrated mobility. Uh, next uh, slide, please. And, and you can click one more. Yes, this is another one, a uh, scale up. Um, and here you see again, uh, what I found interesting, the, the idea that we are not only looking at governance from an urban level or from a 10T level, but we need to ensure these different geographical layers um, have a governance which can work together. Uh, and on all on all aspects, so not only the physical aspects, uh, implementation of, of uh, safe and clean transport, uh, multimodal transport, and and the, the digital aspects, but also from the side of human behavior. So this idea that we need to go across different geographical scopes, uh, not only look at the city as a separate entity or the TNT network as a separate entity, but at the interconnections between them. Uh, this is also very much part of what we're trying to do in the ITS directive, at trying to to have a more um, a broader approach, a more encompassing approach. The next slide. This is from the uh, Indimo project, and as I said uh, just now, you know, there's also a, a, a user-centric approach being very clearly defined now, or coming more to the forefront. I think this was a good example of that, where in Indimo and in this co-creation community, uh, they created a toolbox looking at how um, um, all these mobility services can interface with the actual end users. So uh, through, through a design manual, uh, keeping in mind uh, security and privacy, uh, the interface being simple and intuitive, you see here really a focus on inclusive digital mobility solutions so that the services which we are rolling out, which, which governments are rolling out, authorities are rolling out, actually reach the end users in a, in a simple, safe uh, and, and efficient way. Uh, next slide, please. I mentioned here the uh, the accessibility. Of course, another very important point to ensure that uh, people with disabilities have the opportunity to access public transport services in real time or assess even public transport services in real time, meaning that they can report if they have issues, for instance, uh, with the access to a train, access to a bus. And uh, in this uh, TRIPS project, they can actually also report it to um, uh, local transport operators. Uh, so that they can resolve these issues very quickly and also monitoring the comfort gaps which they experience. Because in the end, people with reduced mobility should be able to travel um, uh, also using public transport means and, and using, again, the mobility system as a whole uh, just as well. Uh, next slide, please. So if I can summarize uh, what, what I've told you today, first of all, 
we see clearly a move in, in terms of scaling up from a holistic to, to a holistic and integrated approach. So taking into account mobility, energy, infrastructure, freight, logistics, we're really trying to loosen ourselves from the silo-based thinking, uh, which, which we've worked from in the past decades. Another focus on this user-centric thinking, again, uh, we realize that what we're doing on the ground, on the roads, is uh, for the users, uh, for road users, for multimodal uh, passengers. So also seeing it from their point of view, how we can best uh, serve their needs. Of course, focus on the governance, digitalization and cybersecurity as, as important aspects to allow us to understand how this holistic approach should, uh, should, be, should be done. And as I said, the special attention to persons with reduced mobility. Now, of course, we have challenges as well. First of all, the challenge to collaborate and standardize across domains. That's something that within the ITS directive is very, uh, very important. And we see is, is one of the, the barriers for actually effective deployment. So we need to focus on how to collaborate, especially if you have to consider all these different uh, domains, which, which have to uh, integrate more and more. Second point is finding the successful business models. So what are the incentives? Can we find ways that uh, um, uh, service providers uh, find the business models which make sense, which uh, help uh, citizens and which ev eventually are self-supporting and can develop uh, uh, successfully as well. Another challenge, of course, is getting everyone to, to digitalize, especially from the public side. There's a lack of IT skills and resources to do this. So when we are asking to mandate certain data, um, we, of course, are very well aware that this needs to be uh, backed financially. This needs to have a, a long lead in time to ensure that authorities can get their skills and resources up to speed. Uh, and, and also from the, from the private side, of course, that this uh, investment can be matched. And then in terms of cross-border interoperability, in the end, what we're trying to do is, of course, that anyone who travels from A to B uh, across the European Union can do so in a seamless way uh, by using the same kind of services, the same kind of apps, and they can expect the same level of service everywhere they travel. So these are kind of the challenges that we are dealing with uh, in, in, the, in the domain uh, with respect to the, uh, to the ITS directive. I think that was all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Eduardo. And uh, yeah, I, what, I, what I recall from this presentation is that uh, the ITS directive is already, uh, let's say, 10 to 11 years old. That during that time, there was a lot of progress made, but that there is still a lot of challenge to, to go forward, I guess. But I think, uh, and that, that uh, narrows me to the question that I see here on the screen, um, because one of the questions to you is, uh, well, in this 10, 11 years that the ITS directive is there, uh, it has delivered, there was a promise, there, there was expectations, but how, how do you know, exactly know that is, uh, that, that ITS actually delivers the benefits that, you're, that were envisioned? How do you measure that? How do you know that? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. That's also, of course, very tricky because uh, ITS is just one of the elements that we're, we're investing in uh, for the broader benefits of reduced emissions, reduced congestion, and more safer roads. So how do we know exactly the share of ITS in reducing mm -hmm. emissions, reducing congestion, and reducing uh, fatalities? So uh, we have, of course, uh, various monitoring programs uh, which we've supported in the past. The EU EIP is one which looked at uh, the corridor, the, the ITS corridor deployment and their achievements, where we do see some, some concrete results. Of course, it's something which, as I said, is very hard to measure specifically. So we know it's very beneficial. We, we've done an impact assessment on the ITS directives re revision, which showed uh, a very, very positive cost-benefit ratio, meaning that you know through digitalization, you will save time in traffic, uh, we will reduce congestion, and we will uh, save lives. Um, and this is a very, very positive ben cost-benefit ratio. At the same time, we still need to work on the KPIs. We still need to work on the data collection so that we can effectively measure these benefits and make them more tangible. And I really believe that if we invest in that, uh, in, the, in the monitoring and the KPIs, uh, more and more authorities will be convinced that these benefits are there, that they are tangible, that they that they that they bring, uh, you know, the the, the the right benefits to, this, to to their citizens, so that ITS can really be an effective policy instrument to reach the uh, the policy goals of reducing emissions and making safer and cleaner cleaner cities. Okay. 
And Lisa, I, I guess there is a question that very, you want. Yeah, yes. yeah, and, very interesting. Indeed, not easy to measure, <laughs> not even easy to separate out. Exactly. Yes. Um, I have a question here for Guillaume, going back to Michelin uh, DDI, who we heard um, from at the beginning. Um, can you tell us, Guillaume, a little bit about some of the customers that you're working with today, please? Yes, of course. Um, so our customers are on both sides of the Atlantic, right? Uh, as we have operations uh, both in Europe and uh, and in the US. So uh, in France, uh, for example, we have been working with uh, road authorities. I can name uh, Lyon Metropole, for which uh, we have done uh, several uh, um, hotspots analysis, before after analysis uh, to confirm the effectiveness of some uh, roadworks or uh, corrective actions. And uh, in the US, uh, we are currently working with the state DOT of Utah, uh, which is leveraging our near miss data to uh, identify the most dangerous uh, situations. Yeah. That's... Yes. Yeah. We lost Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the thanks for, thanks for the answer, uh, Guillaume. My pleasure. Uh, there was also a question to Marcus, if I may. Um, uh, how can the base plate data be integrated in a third-party management system? I think it's from the authorities or the city authorities that they say, okay, well, you generate this data. How does how do you then integrate it? Uh, you're muted, uh, Marcus. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. So it's a very good question. Actually, I think uh, uh, you recognize that we are actually talking about open data, which is our approach. So uh, what we actually do is we uh, want to provide the data using standard interfaces. That means actually uh, we don't keep our data in our own, let's say, cloud environment in our own system. So what we actually try to achieve is. Um, to collect the data in a very easy manner and to provide data to all kinds of systems. So there are plenty of interfaces available, also secure interfaces like Datex2 and whatsoever. So we don't just keep the data, we really bring them to the to the um, systems where, where it's needed. Yeah. Okay, and you mentioned Datex2 as a, as a, as a feature. For example, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's quite interesting in view of the the European Commission and their NAPCOR, uh, NAPCOR project, I guess. Um, good, yeah. I have, uh, a, uh, and, and I have a little question for, uh, for Ibon, um, if I may. Ibon, you were giving an example of one of the, the cities, one of the smaller cities you had, you had worked uh, with, right? What are the main challenges if you were to use the solution with bigger cities? <laughs> Yes, it's it's a it's a good question because really the the main challenge uh, for to 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 bring this to the big cities is not a technical challenge. I mean, uh, technically, it's, it's it's the same a small city and a big city for us. But but really, sometimes the the problem is how the big cities have to manage this kind of uh, different. Uh, projects that are not the, the usual projects in, in, in the city, because in this case, as they were a small city, there was a very good coordination between the police department and the Department of Infrastructure, but this is not usual. And, 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 and normally, uh, there is a lot of bureaucracy that, that has to do a city when, when they want to work between departments. So I think that this is really the the big challenge with the big cities because they, they need a lot of data, they, they need a lot of information, but uh, collaborating between the among departments uh, could be very easy, but uh, without this collaboration, it's, it's not so easy. Okay, well, good luck <laughs> when, you <laughs> yeah. bigger, yeah. when you move to the bigger <laughs> ones, because I can imagine there is a little bit more complex uh, you know, I'm going to be harsh. Working with authorities is always uh, quite a challenge, uh, but okay, <laughs> maybe that's also an explanation. And, and in fact, uh, in fact, uh, 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 looking looking to uh, Eduardo, uh, Eduardo, uh, you can probably give also an, uh, uh, a good since we now see all this progress and and, and we see how it's going. 
I think we, we ask you your vision uh, on the way of connected automated drive. How how will it uh, how will it go? How how will it? Uh, what's your vision of that for the future? Yeah, uh, that's a that's a good question. Let it be noted that it's a vision, and of course, uh, I don't have the uh, the uh, the all the answers, and, and for sure, I don't have a crystal ball. But um, I, I would say that the biggest challenge is to ensure that what we're deploying now in terms of automated mobility works across the EU. That's, I think, the, the starting point. Um, looking at, for instance, how how um, electric vehicles are charged with all the different kind of adapters, these are the kind of things that going forward in automated uh, transport, and uh, which we should try to avoid. Yeah? So um, automated vehicles should be able to drive anywhere across the EU. Um, the, the OEMs, the, uh, the vehicle manufacturers, should be able to rely on uh, the fact that their vehicle can interface with infrastructure anywhere across the EU, um, that the data is there to support automated driving, uh, so that infrastructure data is created, that data sets uh, providing speed limits, providing uh, restrictions to roads are all, are all available, because that digital layer is absolutely, absolutely needed for them to be able to, to drive. I don't, I don't think that sensor-only or sensor-based driving is going to uh, give us the uh, the automated mobility that we're expecting. Um, the biggest challenge, of course, is going to be in, in urban areas where uh, the, there's loads of interfaces with other modes. Uh, so especially in, in those areas, how we're going to see automation developed there is still uh, the biggest question mark. I, I'm quite sure that uh, on, on the main corridors, uh, in, in the relatively easier traffic uh, engineering situations, uh, automation is, is very promising. We'll go, we're going to see it being developed more and more in the coming years. I think uh, the connected and cooperative side of, of ITS is, is, is extremely important in that. Um, so that will for sure help us and, and, and lead us to see results in the coming years. As I said, in terms of the urban environment, that's going to be still a, a very big challenge and will depend very, very heavily on the available uh, data which, which is being provided by uh, authorities. Hmm. Okay, interesting. And, uh, and a very good uh, answer. And of course, the crystal ball is uh, for other people. Huh? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, in fact, I'm, I'm still asking if the audience can send questions. And uh, I guess, Lisa, you have. Uh, you yeah, have I have a question here uh, indeed for, for Guillaume again. Uh, Guillaume, um, are you working on connected tire and related data? Is the question. Yes, of course, it's a very uh, natural question for uh, uh, related to a uh, Michelin group uh, historical activity, right? Uh, making tires since 130 years. So actually, the group is uh, uh, is in the process of connecting all tires that are made. Uh, not sure that is it is well known, but any uh, track tire uh, built uh, nowadays comes with the RFID chip and uh, it is being deployed for the passenger car uh, uh, tires. The fact is that currently, as we speak, uh, Michelin DDI does not uh, collect the tire data, right? We have other means of uh, collecting data, either via our other activities like fleet management or via our own proprietary hardware that we deploy in the cars or via data partnerships, as I mentioned uh, earlier. So not yet uh, tire data, but uh, uh, wait for the future, huh? Aha, the crystal ball we were talking about before. <laughs> A little part of it. <laughs> and uh, Lisa, may, may I myself ask a question uh, to the others, and especially to Ibon and Marcus, uh, because uh, both of you are innovators, you are uh, part of the startup activity. You have, let's say, boots on in the, in the ground, uh, in, in the real world. Uh, I, what I see and, and, and is that you collect a lot of data and you do that with, uh, uh, you do that in a certain area, a certain living lab, like uh, for instance in Graz or in, or in Spain. Uh, the question that I have is, how do you see your, because your solution, I guess you want to have it European-wide or many cities involved or territories involved. Can you give an insight on, on how you think you can leverage your solution from, for instance, Graz to Europe or to maybe more cities in Vienna, in, in Austria first and then to, to Europe? And maybe the same question to Ipon, how you scale your solution, how you intend to scale your solution across Europe? 
Marcus, That's a very good question. I mean, one of the answers. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Just to answer your question, I mean, uh, first of all, um, thanks. Uh, we already have some new projects in plan, so Graz will not be the only one for this year. So we are very active in Austria and, and Germany for the moment. So there's a lot of potential, but it's a right question about um, scalability, about uh, multiplication. Uh, what we see currently is uh, important to start with pilot projects. So to start small and think big. Yeah? Um, so first of all, uh, we also have to convince our customer that it's worth for spending for such solution. So that at the end you have to identify value uh, and value proposition also to prove that um, that it has a huge impact on um, let's say cost uh, effectiveness also on time on on uh, improvement on the process so we think that personally we'll start with a lot of, of, of pilots projects and more and more prove our solution and um, by proving the solution we think that we can also multiply that to to cities who have similar problems yeah so um, I think it's all about uh, proving with your customer and uh, providing facts yeah, that this is a solution which which help them to improve effectiveness and 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 costs. Yeah. And even if um, mm -hmm. ask your ideas about that. Yeah, in, in our case, Nasimov, uh, we work in urban uh, in cities, but also in inter-urban roads. Uh, in both cases, we started in Spain, of course, but in interurban roads, we, we started in January also a proof of concept in the Netherlands. Just to, to, to adduce these things that we have to adduce when we go from one country to another. But now we are also launching proposals for, for Latin America in Brazil and in Mexico. And I'm really, uh, technically, it's, it's quite easy to to the scale, uh, the problem is more the, this this uh, way to approach to the, the public administrations that are always uh, they, they have normally the the reference companies and the ways to do and and, and these disruptive ways are uh, sometimes difficult to to understand. But really, technically, we we have not issues and 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 what we we are trying to to open this kind of market. Yeah. So it's really a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship that you have to build with every of the road authorities, cities. Uh, really, it's one-to-one -one mainly in the in the early adopters of each country. I mean, uh, we 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 have analyzed which are these early adopters in in the different European countries and also in Latin America, and 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 we are trying to to make this one-to-one -one with this because then in 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 our case we we have a clear vision that. Uh, the rest of the people will follow these these early adopters. Early adopters are, for example, if what is starting in the Netherlands or is here the ministry or or some cities that are uh, normally the early adopters. Yeah. Okay. Uh... Excellent. I have a, a question now for Eduardo. Um, Eduardo, you talked about the the challenges that were. Uh, in front of us, and you were talking also about um, getting all to digitalize, right? Including making sure that the IT skills and resources are there. And the question here is, can you go a little bit, become a little bit more granular and give a couple of concrete examples on that? Yeah, so the biggest challenge that, that, uh, that's there for many, many member states, especially those which have uh, very rural areas with lots of uh, small municipalities where there's maybe one mayor, who has to deal with everything related to to uh, to his citizens, his or her citizens? I can imagine it's it's for them very very hard to 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 understand that they need to take up extra tasks in terms of digitalizing a change in the speed limit, or to ensure that you know if there's roadwork somewhere that these roadworks are also um, uh, available in a digital format somewhere. So I can understand that challenge very very much, and and I think there the 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 solution could be that member states need to look at at which level you want to organize this, uh, which level of governance you want to organize this. So maybe not task and burden uh, these small community mayors to, to do this kind of work, but have regional, provincial organizations that can provide the IT skills in a central, centralized way, or, or at least a semi-centralized way, 
uh, to really guide these kinds of communities in their dig di di digitalization uh, um, uh, activities. In the end, if I'm driving an automated vehicle, or if it's, it's auto driving itself, but I'm driving in an automated vehicle, uh, it's important for the vehicle to know that there's road work somewhere, that the road is blocked, that there's been an accident, uh, that, the, that the vehicle is, 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 is small enough to pass under a tunnel or over a bridge. So we need to have this kind of information where, wherever it is, how granular the, the, the geographical scope may be. Uh, so mm -hmm. again, it's a matter of, of finding the right level of governance and organizing this uh, so that the IT skills and expertise and resources are bundled as much as possible. Okay, Frank, I think you have another question. Yeah, uh, it's quite an interesting question, also from my side, in fact. Uh, uh, and again, to Imbon and Marcus uh, as innovators. Eh? So uh, you are doing a lot of effort. You you are part of projects like Imbon said, okay, from the EIT, urban mobility. Uh, so you're working closely in projects, but are there in general expectations that or uh, let's say uh, elements that uh, that you think that the EC can support you in your activity as an innovator. What's your expectations to the EC, to the European Commission? Marcus or Ibel, maybe Marcus first. Yeah, okay. You're um, okay. You're up. Okay. Go. On. I mean, I think yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Good question. I think. For us, it's very important because we are quite a new startup. We have founded our company actually last year, um, almost during lockdown. So for mm -hmm. us, it's very important actually to to talk to many, many people because for us, we want to listen to our customers and we want to understand the pain points and how we can help not just you know marketing our solution. So we really want to learn with our customers and talk to many customers, yeah, because we want to to, to think about the core problems and we want to solve the core problems and pains. Yeah. So, you know, um, I'm, I'm an IT guy. Yeah? So what I think is important does not necessarily mean that this is important to authority guy, to the authority <laughs> people. Yeah. So for us, it's really important to say, uh, if somebody is telling us guys, what you're doing is not interesting, but yeah, then it's important for us to understand that. And I think such a Congress of meeting many people, <clears throat> understanding a lot of the pains, is the most valuable we can we can get out. Yeah, of course uh, we're also looking for for potential pilots where we can uh, replicate the story which we do, for example, in Graz. Yeah, we want to prove also in other cities that this is a, a core topic to um, to go on to proceed. Um, but as I said, mainly uh, it's very important for us to get the real feedback from the from the real life and real world. Yeah. Um, so in case, Frank, uh, I think facilitating yes. relationships and making sure that you reach as many as many authorities as possible, uh, and also ask their uh, facilitator their uh, let's say the their questions what what are what are what they really need. Okay, and Ibon, uh, you have the same idea yes. or? Uh, yeah, but I, I I wanted to remember the things that have uh, mentioned Eduardo uh, before uh, related to the autonomous vehicles, uh, the data collection from the from the OEMs, and and so on so on. Uh, it's it's very important to 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 regulate all all these things and and to try to to, to have a, a direct path to the future of the digitalization and and, and how to get all this data. Uh, but sometimes I see in some public administrations, not in all, uh, that when we are talking with them, they are uh, waiting uh, for the results of these uh, third parties. I mean, the OEMs, and they are waiting day to solve the problem. And really, in, in the case that we are approaching, that is the control of the infrastructures and the, and the, and, and the wood, a good map of all the elements and, and these kind of things. Really, the public administration has to take the, uh, the, the, the leadership in, in these kind of things. Uh, of course, working with the European Commission and, 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 and taking decisions of that, because uh, in another way, each OEM is working in their business uh, and, and know in, in these uh, common uh, decisions. No? So, so really, I think that, uh, well, I, I would expect uh, uh, some kind of coordination 
or to, to take the decisions uh, from the public administrations in a, in a common way in Europe. Okay. If I may jump on that directly, if, if, yeah. if, if I might. Yes. Uh, I heard the word coordination, which is excellent because that's exactly what also we're trying to uh, to achieve in terms of of our our our, uh, our input. Um, we have actually a session during the, the Congress on this. So on the Wednesday uh, at 11:45, there is a session uh, called Cooperation to Ensure uh, Integrated and Harmonized Approach for the Digitalization. So the idea is that uh, there are several platforms working together to see so, so, so to guide deployment of ITS. We would like them to work more together and that the deployment of ITS and CITS is coordinated from a single single platform, which means that authorities can go to this platform to find help and guidance in the use of specifications, uh, what uh, the European Commission as uh, legislation is demanding from them, how to deploy services, how to share data, all these kinds of things can then be, can, can be, can be guided, uh, the authorities can be guided in this uh, through this platform. So this is actually something which is being created and uh, if you're interested, please do visit the session, uh, uh, the, the special interest session uh, called Duplo. Yeah, they're very interesting. And and just uh, a very strange uh, question coming from the audience now is that they also ask us, Ethico, what, what our role is in this uh, process. So maybe Lisa, since you are online, I think you are the best person to answer that. Sure. I think Atico is really quite uniquely placed because what we do is we connect the dots uh, between all these different players in the ecosystem. Um, if if you know Atico a little bit and if you maybe look look a little bit on our website, you will see that we have eight different verticals um, that work together, and this is very very rare. Uh, and on top of that, you know, it's both public sector and private sector. Uh, across the region, and we also have our sister organizations in Asia Pacific and in the US. So this idea of really having an integrated approach, bringing all the stakeholders together, connecting the dots, this is really at the heart of uh, of what we do. Yeah, and, I and have, yeah, sorry, yeah. please go ahead, Frank. Go ahead, Felisa. No, I just we're, we're coming to to an end, but I, I just had one last question for Guillaume for Mishna, um, if I may. You talked Guillaume about how what you do is you collect the data and you transform the data, right? And you collect the data from many different sources. Um, data is the new currency, as we know, but there are also sometimes challenges around bringing data together. And I just wanted to hear, have you had any challenges in getting all the different sources, you know, on board? Uh, or has there been reluctance? Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, of course, and uh, thank you for your question, because I think it is the, uh, you know, the, 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 the central question for all of all of this kind of businesses. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, data is the is uh, not oil of the future right oil of today right <laughs> so um, so uh, so the sourcing of the data is uh, is absolutely essential and uh, at the mission group we are very cautious in uh, gdpr uh, rules right so uh, um, we take very seriously uh, uh, the security of the data and the anonymization of the data we have been co-working with the french uh, uh, national uh, institution for uh, data privacy so that uh, that's probably uh, not a challenge it's just a rule that uh, uh, we must be uh, very careful in uh, in uh, applying and then of course uh, as data as a value well uh, sourcing uh, of data is like sourcing of any raw material right it's about uh, sharing the value and uh, and uh, and making sure that there is a, an uh, added value to the uh, final customer otherwise it's not worth collecting the data storing the data and paying for all the infrastructure mm. so uh, that's uh, if i can a uh, quick summary right uh, of the uh, data sourcing uh, challenges huh? uh, i will be happy to uh, welcome you at our booth Elisa, and the other presenters so that we can uh, pursue those uh, those data related discussions huh? excellent look forward to it let me end now by 
you know, now that you mentioned that you look forward to meeting and us on the stand, just want to remind everybody that uh, the registration uh, at the current rate uh, ends tomorrow, Friday at midnight. So remember to register if you want today's rate because it goes up after that. Uh, and also thank you so much for all of uh, the participants to listen in and thank you to the speakers here. Thank you to Frank, my colleague and my colleagues, Rita, who uh, has been very key in organizing this whole webinar. Very, very much appreciate your time and see you in Toulouse. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Well, see you in Toulouse. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.